All right, section 1.6 is just titled Miscellaneous Equations. Um, so there's a bunch of different kinds of equations that don't really have a, um, a set uh, sort of category to put them in, so we're kind of putting them all together. There's a bunch of different ones that we're going to see in this section. Um, the first one, we've actually seen something a little bit like it before, um, but this is also a little bit different. So there's a radical involved. Um, so the first one is going to be called roots. Um, and so what you notice that makes this different than the square root problems that we might have seen before or whatever, too, um, is that we're actually given the problem with a radical in it as opposed to putting the radical in ourselves, right? We were solving some problems uh, in the quadratic section with finding the square root of something. Here, the problem starts out with the square root of something. So as we're taking a look at this, what is the opposite operation of a square root? It's a square. So we're going to square both sides. Now, the whole point on the left-hand side is that the square root and the square cancel, leaving me with x minus 1. Check your head if that makes sense. Okay, good. Now, on the right-hand side, I know we've talked about this before, but I want to mention it again because it's a really easy thing to forget. You cannot distribute a square through a set of parentheses. You have to multiply it out. I need to do x minus 7 times x minus 7. That's what squaring means. Squaring means multiplying something by itself. And when you have a binomial, like this one, two terms, right, we have to actually multiply first, outer, inner, last. Or we have to distribute, if you want to use that language. So on the left-hand side, I have x minus 1. And on the right-hand side, I'm going to distribute. So I have x times x, which would be x squared. I have x times negative 7, that's negative 7x. And then in the middle, I have the negative I have 7 distributed through. So I have negative 7 times x, which would be another negative 7x. And then negative 7 times 7, negative 7, which would be positive 49. Okay? So in particular, if you tried to square each term, you'll see you would be missing this piece, right? If you squared the first, squared the last, the negative 7 and negative 7, those would not be there. And we would end up with a wrong answer as a result. So they should, in fact, be there. Um, as I'm looking at the first sort of cleanup step, I would consolidate them, though, right? I would have negative 14x here and my 49. Okay. So this is now a quadratic equation, just like section 1.5. Whenever I'm dealing with a quadratic equation, I have a couple of options, but usually speaking, I just want everything to be grouped on the same side. I can factor, I can complete the square, I can use the quadratic formula, but it all hinges on it being all grouped together. And typically, if it factors, that's our quickest solution. If you're looking for something that's working like all the time in a very rigorous sort of way, the quadratic formula is probably your best solution. But unless it gives you a, a prescriptive, like it says, do it with this method, you can choose what you want. Now, to start with, I need to subtract the x. And I'm going to move it over to the left-hand side because the left-hand side has the x squared on it already. And I'm going to add the 1. And I'm just going to do those in the same step. That leaves me with a 0 on the left. I have x squared minus 15x and plus 50. Is that all right? Okay. Now, I think this one factors. Um, 50 is a very nice value at the end. 15 seems like I could reasonably get something out of this. So I'm going to try for factoring. If we run into problems, we might backtrack and decide to use the quadratic formula. That's fine. Um, I would know that for factoring, trial and error anyway, those both need to be x's. Um, I need two numbers that are both negative. The reason they have to be both negative is because I have to multiply to be a positive. And they have to add to be a negative in the middle. So I need two negatives. Yeah, it is negative 5 and negative 10. Good job. And then we'll set each part equal to 0. Let me come up here where I've got a little more space. So x, of x minus 5 equals 0 and x minus 10 equals 0. Add my 5. So x is equal to 5. And add my 10. So x is equal to 10. Okay. 
Now, there have been some cases along the way where I've said you can always check and see if your solutions work. And there have also been some cases where I've said you absolutely need to check and see if they work. Because sometimes the way we solve problems introduces things that don't actually work in the original problem. And this is a case of this. I absolutely need to check and see if both of these solutions really work in that first equation. Because when I take a square root and then I square it and I square both sides, I may have just introduced something that doesn't really work. Okay, so it didn't, it didn't, we did it wrong. It's just that sometimes solutions, quote unquote, get introduced by that process that aren't really solutions at all. So we're going to take each of these and we're going to plug them back into the original equation. And I'm going to clean it up just a minute to remind us what it was. But it's this piece right here, all of it as is. So we will start with 5. So I've got the square root, whoa, let me do white, square root of 5 minus uh, 1. And I want to see if that's going to equal 5 minus 7. It is. Is it? Five it's not. Daniel, what's one. wrong? Do you see what's wrong, Daniel? Oh, I see. The one on the right side. Yeah, the one on the right side is negative, and this one would actually be positive. And that's exactly what squaring can do, right? Because if you squared both of these, they would both be 4, right? 2 squared is 4, negative 2 squared is 4, and it sort of eliminates the sign issue but this absolutely doesn't work, right? I get the wrong sign. So when we get a solution like this, that's not really a solution at all, it actually has a name. Um, this actually is called an extraneous solution. So it's sort of a, a solution that comes out of the work that doesn't actually really work in the original equation the way it was given. So that is not an actual solution. It's called an extraneous solution. We should still check that the 10 works, too. It probably will. Oftentimes, one will not work and one will. But it could be that both of them don't work, or it could be that both of them do. So you actually have to check both of them. So the square root of 10 minus 1, and we have 10 minus 7. What do you think? Yeah. Okay, so what is 10 minus 1? 9. What's the square root of 9? 3. And then 10 minus 7 is 3. So these two do work. And in particular, it's the signs that usually screw things up, and this one's sign actually matched. So if we're looking for what's the actual solution to our question, the solution is x equals 10. Now, sometimes they'll ask you to state any extraneous solutions as well, like it's a separate question within the question, you know. And if they did that, you would say x equal 5 would be an extraneous solution. Does that make sense? Okay, great. All right, let's take a look at another one in this category. Um, this one looks a little bit different. What is different about this problem than the previous one? It's got two square roots. And as much as it would be really nice to just square each individual piece, clearly when we talked about this one over here, I wasn't able to square each individual piece, right? I wasn't. I told you we can't just square the x and square the 7. We actually have to multiply it out. So we're going to actually have to do that here as well. But the easiest way to do that is first by moving the square root of x, or at least one of them, to the other side. So we're going to separate our radicals. So one radical is by itself and alone. The other one, which is sort of unfortunate that it's not, is on the other side. Now, I still just can't square each piece. Obviously, that's the whole you know, point I was making on the last problem. But I can square both sides. Now, on the left-hand side, again, the whole point is that the square root and the square cancel because it's a single square root with a square root. So that will give me the x plus 40. But on the right-hand side, because the addition happens separately with the two pieces like this, right? It's not one radical over the whole thing like it was on the left. I need to multiply 4 plus square root x times 4 plus square root of x, just like if I didn't have the radical on the right-hand side over that x, right? That's exactly what I did over here. This one just doesn't look as pretty because one of them is a radical that I've got to distribute out. But it's the same process. So we're going to distribute this out. So we have 4 times 4 is 16, and I have 4 times square root of x, so 4 square root of x. And then I have the square root of x distributed out. 
So I have square root of x times 4, so that's 4 square root of x, the same value. And then I have square root of x times square root of x, which is what? Square root of x squared. Yep, square root of x squared. But what is square root of x squared? X. Just x. Now, there are some really nice things that are about to happen. Um, let's go ahead and combine the two radical x parts that we still have, though, before I show you what nice things are about to happen. So I have x plus 40 on the left, and I have 16, and then 8 square root of x, and x on the right. Is everybody good so far? Okay, so our goal now, truly, is to isolate the radical. Now... As I try to isolate the radical by moving the x, what do you notice happens to the x? They cancel out. That's really nice because it means the only variable that's left in our equation is the radical x part. So that's a very friendly feature. Now I have 40 left on the left. I have 16 plus 8 squared x on the right. Much nicer. It can move my 16 with subtraction. What is 40 minus 16? 24. 24. Okay, my goal is to isolate the radical, so what would I do next? Divide by eight. Yep, divide by 8. Okay, so now I'm at the point where I have 3 on the left and I have radical x on the right. What would I do to solve for x? I would square both sides, right? I want to undo the square root. The opposite operation to that is squaring. So the square root squared on the, the right-hand side becomes just an x. And then what's 3 squared? Nine. 9. Now, again, I squared twice in this problem, didn't I? I squared at the beginning, and I squared sort of midway through or toward the end. So I absolutely have to check to make sure that when I did that, I didn't end up you know, inadvertently changing a sign that was negative to positive. Okay, because that can happen. We saw it happen in the last problem. So we need to check our original solution, or our solution in the original equation, which was up here. So my solution is supposed to be a 9. So what I want to check is that when I plug in the 9, it works. I'm going to do it up here since I've got a little more space. So we have 9 plus 40 underneath a radical. And then I have minus the square root of 9. And the question is, does it equal 4? So what is 9 plus 40? Fabulous, 49. So a square root of 49 minus square root of 9. What's the square root of 49? 7. And what's the square root of 9? 3. And does, in fact, 7 minus 3 equal 4? Yes. It does. So this one actually worked out. I don't have any extraneous solutions. It's actually a legit solution to the question. So what happens if you forget to check your solutions? Well, sometimes when you forget to check your solutions, it won't matter. Here it wouldn't have, right? If you forgot to check this solution and you just plowed right on through and it really is a solution, nobody's going to be the wiser for it. I'm not, you're not, nobody's going to know because it worked. If you forget to check your solutions and one doesn't work, that's when things are going to show you that you've made an error, right? I've got an error on this problem if I just tell that the solution is 5 and 10 because one of them really isn't a solution. So this sort of check step thing is for your benefit because you don't know. Right? Sometimes you're good and you can skip it and it wouldn't matter, but sometimes you're not. All right, I have one more that doesn't quite look like it fits in this category, but it does, so I would like to show you why. So this one is actually x to the two-thirds equals one-half. So I'd like to remind you what you have seen before about fractional exponents. May have been a while, because I don't think we saw this in intermediate, did we? No. I don't feel like we did. So, yeah, it is something you would have seen in high school. Um, the, the value in the denominator here, this 3, actually is the radical index. It would be a cube root, because it's a 3, and the squared is still an x squared. Okay, that's, that's how that would look. So, in general, what happens is if you have x to the m over n, then this piece becomes n, and this piece becomes m. Okay, so the numerator is still the power. The denominator of that power becomes a radical's index. So in our problem, like we already said, this would be the cube root 
of x squared. All right, so ignore the x squared part specifically right now because the cube root is on the outside of what's going on, right? How do I undo a cube root? By cubing, right? How did I undo a square root? By squaring. How do I undo a cube root? By cubing. So we're going to cube both sides. Now, the whole thing, again, the point is that it cancels the cube root on the left, leaving me with x squared. On the right, I need to multiply 1 half times 1 half times 1 half. Well, that's going to give me a 1 on top. What will I have on bottom? Eight. I'll have an 8. Okay, we're halfway done. And then we need to take the square root because the way I undo a square is I square root. Now, this is not as friendly. It's just the stuff from intermediate that was not y'all's favorite. Okay, it doesn't come up all the time, but it does occasionally. We've got the square root of 1 and we've got the square root of 8. Well, the square root of 1 is 1. And then the square root of 8, I have to break it down. How will it break down? Okay, so I have three twos, right? Should be 2 square root 2. Is everybody good with that? Okay. But you don't get to leave radicals in the denominator. We have to rationalize them. And so I multiply by the actual square root itself that remains. So on top, I have the square root of 2. On the bottom, there's this 2. And then I have the square root of 2 times 2, square root of 2. So what is the square root of 2 times the square root of 2? It's 2. So now I have the original 2 that's out here times this 2, which gives me 4. And I cannot simplify the 2 under the radical with the 4 all by itself. One's underneath a radical, one's not. They're not in the same location. They can't be reduced. Yes, ma'am. You got the 4 from doing 2 square root 2 times square root 2. Correct. Not, not times... Yes, yes, you, yes, you're correct. So there's a 2 on the outside right here, Kenny, right? And then when I multiply square root of 2 times square root of 2, that's 2. Haley, is that you? Or yeah. Kayla, who said, who's talking? Okay. Haley. So many times, if I had the square root of 2? Yep. So does the 2 and 2, does it essentially cancel out and then you just get like your outside? Well, square root of 2 times square root of 2 is the square root of 4. Mm -hmm. And what's the square root of 4? Mm -hmm. Yep, that's what's happening. So that's why this 2 is occurring down here. And then I still already have the 2 that was on the outside that gets multiplied as well. Okay. okay so that's why this fits in the roots section of this section of material, 1.6, is because exponents... Fractional exponents are actually radicals, just a different form. All right, shifting gears. You ready for the next set? Okay, we've seen absolute values a little bit before, um, but when we saw them before, they were in that linear section, back in section 1-1, one, one, I think. Um, the difference between that and what we're seeing here now is that they don't end up always being linear. So in particular, you'll notice right here that the absolute value includes something underneath or inside of the absolute value that's not linear, right? It's quadratic in particular. Now, the process is much the same. So because I have an absolute value and it equals 1, the part that's underneath or inside of the absolute value could be positive or it could be negative. Because when I take the absolute value of a positive number, it just stays the same. And when I take the absolute value of a negative number, the numerical portion stays the same and the sign changes. So what does that mean for this problem? Well, it means that the piece that's underneath here, a squared minus 1, it could equal 1. It could. Because if I take the absolute value of a positive number, it stays positive. But that part that's underneath there, it also could equal negative 1. Because if I took the absolute value of negative 1, what would I get? 1. OK? So there's two possibilities of the part that's underneath the, um, or inside of the absolute value. It could equal the positive number, or it could equal the negative number. Because what we're actually saying is that if I took the absolute values on these two sides, I'd have the same equation as before. 
If I took the absolute values on each of these sides, I'd have the same equation as before. Because this one, the right-hand side would equal 1, and this one, the right-hand side would equal 1. Okay, so that's why it works. It works to take what's under, inside of the absolute value and set it equal to the positive part, and what's inside the absolute value and set it equal to the negative part. Now, we haven't solved anything. I'm just trying to argue why we're doing this in this way. So I end up with these two equations. Okay? They're quadratic, though, but they're actually very nice quadratics because they don't have a linear term. They just have an a squared only. So I can solve them without having to do any factoring because I only have one variable. I can add one to both sides. This would give me a squared equals 2. And then what would I do? I would square root. So a is equal to what? You're missing something. Ah, plus or minus the square root of 2. On the other one, we would add our 1, but it's actually even nicer. What does a squared equal here? 0. zero. And if I square root, what's the square root of 0? Zero? 0. So I actually here end up getting three potential solutions. Positive square root of 2, negative square root of 2, and 0. And I need to check them to make sure that they all really work. So let's take our original equation and check them one at a time. So first we're going to check square root of 2. So if I have absolute value of the square root of 2 squared uh, minus 1, the question is, does this equal 1? All right, so what is the square root of 2 squared? 2, right? What's 2 minus 1? One? 1. 1. And what's the absolute value of 1? One? 1. It's the same thing. It checks. You get the next one almost for free. It's negative square root 2. So if I have the negative square root 2 squared minus 1, what is negative square root of 2 squared? 4i. No, not 4i. Make, notice where the, where the negative is. The negative is on the outside. It's actually positive 2. When you square a negative, what happens? It becomes positive. So the negative part squared becomes positive. The square root of part squared becomes just the 2. This is still just 2 minus 1 because a negative squared is positive. And what's 2 minus 1? One? 1. And what's the absolute value of 1? One? 1. It's the same. Last one's 0. What is 0 squared? 0. zero. And what is 0 minus 1? One? Negative 1. But what's the absolute value of negative 1? just one, and it checks out and it works. So we actually have three solutions. We have a equals one, uh, square root two, negative square root two, and zero. Do have to write all those out? It depends on what my math I want you to do. If there's a way to put a plus or a minus in and they accept that, then it's great. As far as on your test or your quiz, I don't care if you write it like that at all. You can write the plus or minus two or plus or minus square root of two together for me just fine. Yeah. Okay, ready for another one? Okay, on this one, you actually have two absolute values. Okay? The thing is that it doesn't really matter if their absolute values are on both sides or just on one side. You do the problem the same way. So that's really nice, right? Yeah. So one possibility is that the values inside actually are exactly the same, right? They both equal four. They both equal seven. They both equal four thirds. I don't care what it is, but they're actually equal to one another. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that when I take the absolute values, nothing changes and it's all good. They're both positive. They, they actually equal. They could both equal negatives. Right, the left-hand side could equal negative 2, and the right-hand side is equal to negative 2. And then when I take the absolute values, they both become positive 2, and they're exactly the same. 
So they could both be positive, they could both be negative, in which case they're exactly the same. The other option is that they could be opposite signs of one another, ignoring the absolute value parts. The part that's underneath on the left-hand side could be positive 4, and the part that's underneath on the right-hand side could be negative 4. But when I take absolute values, then they're the same. So one option here, this is the option, is that the signs match. They're, exact, they're exactly the same value. The second option is that they have the same value but opposite signs. So the way that you get that to happen is that you set one side, oops, that's supposed to be a 3, 2x minus 3 to be what it was before, and on the other side, you actually multiply it by a negative. Right? So this option is where they have the same signs on the left, and this option over here is what would happen if they had different signs. Right? If one was positive 4 and the other one was negative 4 and you just multiply the negative 4 by a negative, then they'd be the same. Okay, so there's really just two categories. Either the signs match or the signs don't. If the signs match, we lift the absolute values, set them equal, and we're going to solve. If the signs don't, then we multiply one of them by a negative. At this point, the problem's very straightforward to solve because it's linear, right? I don't have any squareds or square roots or anything like that like I have before. So the first thing I would try to do is collect all the terms onto the same side um, on the x's and on the others. So I'll subtract my 2x, and if you do that, what do you notice here? They cancel out on both sides, don't they? Mm -hmm. And you end up with a negative 3 on the left and a negative 7 on the right. And what does that tell you? Yeah. Sorry, say it again. Oh, it is a positive 7, you're right. But they don't, even but they don't equal, yeah. And so when they don't equal, this is actually no solution. It's absolutely not possible that the two values underneath the, rad or underneath the absolute values or inside the absolute values are the same. They can't be. Right? So there's no solution that comes out of setting them equal to each other. Usually there is, but this one there wasn't. On the other one, as I start to collect, um, let me actually distribute that negative through first. So I have negative 2x and I have minus 7. So on this one, if I start to collect all of the x's onto one side, I would probably move my x's to the left because then they stay positive. So I have 4x minus 3 equals negative 7. Is that okay? And we will add the 3. So I have 4x on the left. What's negative 7 plus 3? Negative 4. And then what would I do? Divide by 4. And I would get x equals negative 1. Okay, but as with every problem in this section, we're going to check and see if it really works. But this is the only possible solution on this one. There was only one answer that came about, right? Guinea. Let me show you the solution on what happens when I try to plug the negative one in, and I think it will be clear why we did what we did. Okay, otherwise I'm just going to say the same thing I already said, and it obviously didn't click when I said it earlier, so I don't want to repeat myself. I want to show you it a little bit differently. So let's take this. I'm going to sh Oops, I didn't want to do that. Shift it up a little bit. So if I take that negative one, I guess I could probably put it over here, and I plug it into both sides, I have 2 times negative 1, minus 3 on the left, and I have 2 times negative 1 plus 7 on the right. Did I get them all in there right with the signs and everything? I think I did. Okay. So the reason my signs sometimes get messed up, just so you know, is because I'm constantly zooming in and zooming out on my screen to be able to write so that you can read it nicely. So I often don't, um, when I zoom in and zoom, zoom out, I don't have the details still present on my screen. So that's why that's happening, just so you know. All right, so what is 2 times negative 1? So I have negative 2 minus 3 on the left, and I would have 2 times negative 1 or negative 2 plus 7 on the right. Okay, so what's negative 2 minus 3? And what's negative 2 plus 7? What's the absolute value of negative 5? And what's the absolute value of positive 5? Okay, so Kenny, let me go back to your question that you asked. Why am I allowed to do this? 
because what's ending up happening is that I'm actually looking for places where the insides are the same value, in this case five, but the signs are opposite. One's positive and one's negative. So back in the problem when I'm trying to find the ways that that happens, I leave one of the values as though it's positive, which means I just take the absolute values off. And I pretend like I assumed that the other value was negative, which means I added a negative on the outside, multiplied by a negative, to figure out what would happen if the sign switched. Then I look for where that actually would happen in that case. Now, it could be that I do that and I don't get a solution, but this time when I did that, I did get a solution. So you'll want to do it both? Always. Yes. So when you're doing this problem, yeah, you're always going to set the equations so that they both equal each other and try to find a solution that way, and where one of them equals the negative of the other side. And there's really nothing special about the fact that I put the negative on the left. I could have put the negative on the right, but you don't want to put the negative on both. That doesn't help you at all. You just pick one side and put it on there, and then you work the problem out that way. It is possible when you get to the end of this, you get two solutions. One solution or no solutions, though. Like, all those possibilities are present in there. So just be aware that just because I got one solution when I did a problem like this doesn't mean that when you do it on your own, you're not going to get something different or a different number of solutions. Okay, there's one more type of equation in this section. Okay, so we've done the ones that are the radicals, the roots. We've done ones that are absolute values and examined what happens there. The last type is called is a quadratic type problem. Okay, so the reason I say quadratic type is because they're not quadratic, but they're solved the same way a quadratic equation would be solved. Okay, so notice on this one, I don't have quadratic. I have x to the fourth, right? Mm -hmm. It's not quadratic. It's actually called quartic, um, but it's not quadratic. But it actually has the same form where the first piece looks like it's something like to a power four, and then the middle piece is to a power two, so it's like half as much, right? And the last piece is a constant. It feels like it's quadratic, but it's not. So it actually solves much the same way, at least upon the beginning. Okay, so it's okay. How do I get x to the fourth? Well, I can do it by getting x squared and x squared. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sure. I need the signs to match because the sign at the end is a positive 10, and I need the signs to both be negative because the sign in the middle is a negative. So I have a negative and a negative, and then y'all are already jumping ahead of me. I need two numbers that multiply to 10 and add to 7. That's 2 and 5. Okay. You can do the AC method. It, it would work, too, if uh, it was something that was more complicated and, or maybe the trial and error, you just got stumped on there somewhere along the way. Um, but you should, if you're doing trial and error, end up with the inner and the outer terms equaling negative 7x squared. And they do, right? They do. So, again, what would I do with a quadratic? Well, the next thing I would do is I would take each of the parentheses parts and I'd set them equal to 0. Sorry, what was that question? No, there's not. Thank you. Better. Okay. Are you good? Okay, so each of the parentheses parts equal to zero. But there's only an x in each of them. I know it's x squared, but there's nothing that's got a linear term, right? So this becomes very much like a problem we saw earlier where we add the value to the other side and we take a square root. So this is x squared equals 2. What would I do to solve that? I would take a square root, and when I take a square root, I have to do plus or minus. So this is plus or minus square root of 2. On the other one, I add my 5. So I have x squared equal 5. And then what would I do? Square root. And x is plus or minus the square root of 5. There's actually four solutions here, right? Yeah. I'm going to skip the check step. Um, I'm going to tell you that they all four do work. Um, but still, again, right, like you should check them to make sure that they all four work. I just want to make sure that I have enough time for the one last question because it's a little weird. Thank God. Okay, it's a little weird. But are you guys good with me? We still should be checking these, even though you're not seeing me check this one right now. Well, there's two right here, positive and a negative, and there's two right here. Yeah. So when yeah. we're putting in our answer, we'll 
To be very, very honest with you, I think that my math lab is going to make you do this. It has a plus or minus, and it's really annoying. It depends on the question. Sometimes it wants you to put the plus or minus, and then sometimes it wants you to lie. So In terms of doing it on a quiz or on a test, it doesn't make any difference to me whether or not you list it as a plus or minus or whether you list them separate. Okay? All right, I have one more question to do with you guys. Ready? And it feels a little bit weird, but it's actually very much like this problem. So here's what I'd like for you to do. I'd like for you to just highlight, underline, circle, I don't care, the part that's in parentheses. Okay? I know, because I erased him. Okay? Pretend like the part in parentheses is just blob. It's blob squared minus two blob minus three equals zero. Y'all are good with working with blob, right? Blob. It's a yellow blob. Mine's yellow. Blob squared minus two blob minus three equals zero. Okay, you ready? Okay. We do not want to square this and simplify and multiply all that out. That is not a good method for this. It's not. That's not the goal. The goal is to think about it like everything in parentheses is a variable itself. You, if you want. So if you really actually wanted to, or not, they already in use, x. We could rewrite this as though it said x squared minus 2x. I think I will actually, minus 3. So the part that's my yellow blob is actually equal to x now. Okay? So my yellow blob, u squared plus 2u, is actually equal to x. If it were written like this, sorry, I should be using white. It shows it better. Uh, factoring this one's actually very straightforward. It's x and x. Um, and then I need the signs to be different in order to get a negative 3 at the end. What two numbers multiply to 3 and add to 2? One and three. I need 1 and 3. I'll need a positive 1 and a negative 3. I set it backwards, actually, yeah. because that's my signs were already that order. Yeah. I decided that the yellow blob, I was going to call it something else, x. Okay, yellow blob is x. Part in parentheses is just given, I just gave it another name. We're about to undo that part, just a second. But is the factoring okay? x minus 3 and x plus 1. Okay, but it's not x, right? I made up x in the middle of the problem. It's really yellow blob, which I also made up. It's really u squared plus 2u. So everywhere I had an x, I'm now going to write u squared plus 2u. And then I have, so I have u squared plus 2u minus 3. And I have u squared plus 2u plus 1 equals 0. I just replaced the x with what it actually is. It's really u squared plus 2u. Mm -hmm. The reason that this is nice is because right now each of these is still quadratic and I still have the ability to try to factor them to finish solving the problem. And they, in fact, do, do both factor. So the first one is quite similar to the, var the problem I already did. So the first one right here, so we're sort of like doing these pieces separately, is going to be u and u. The signs need to be a positive and a negative in order to get a negative at the end. I need two numbers that multiply to 3 and add to 2. I already did that, right? Yeah, but this time it's a positive 3 and a negative 1. Because I need to get a positive 2 in the middle. On the other side, I have two parentheses. And they're both u. And I don't really have a lot of choices. I mean, I can only have it equal 1 at the end, so they must both be 1s. Because if 1 times 1 is 1, that's the only possibility. And my signs are positive. both positive. So I have four sets of parentheses that I would each set equal to 0. u plus 3 equals 0. u minus 1 equals 0. u plus 1 equals 0. And another u plus 1 equals 0, which of course won't give us anything new, but it does. 
So this first one, when I subtract 3, I get u is equal to negative 3. I add 1, and I get u is 1. And I subtract 1, and I get u is equal to negative 1, which I could do twice if you really want to see it. Four solutions, three distinctly different, right, from one another. And again, we could check them all, all three. They do, in fact, all three work on this one. So I'm not going to show that out right now because we're out of time. But they do, in fact, all three work. So even though I ended up with four solutions, two of them repeat, there's really only three solutions to this problem that are distinctly different. Okay? All right. So if you have questions, as always, you're welcome to send me emails of those links. Um, I can... I can definitely answer as long as you email before 9. The Success Center, however, is open until 10, so they might be a better resource, especially if you're wanting some feedback in a verbal form or one-on-one. -on -one. All right? Have a great evening, and I'll see you guys on when, or tomorrow, on Tuesday.